I've walked many a weary mile behind the plough, and I know the drudgery of it. What a waste it is for a human being to spend hours and days behind a slowly moving team of horses. This quote from Henry Ford shows that although he came from a farm, he was not taken with the country lifestyle. But it did give him an interest in tractors. And in the early days, he apparently saw producing a cheap, reliable tractor as a social crusade rather than something to make money from. Well, he wanted a small vehicle for a small farmer, not a huge and expensive thing for the prairies. And here it is. Yes, it survived with minor modifications as the end and lived on until the end of the maintenance. I think I'd better switch it off there. These early tractors weren't made by the Ford Motor Company, but by a separate company Henry Ford founded with Edsel, his son. It was called Henry Ford and Son, and made the Fordson Tractor. The Model T car was being used for ploughing long before the first Model F arrived, and many companies both in America and in Britain were making conversion kits. Lugged rear wheels, a gearing mechanism to reduce speed, extra engine cooling, and a frame for hitching implements were needed. These kits were sold as something which could be fixed to the car for ploughing and then taken off for the trip to church on Sunday. But in practice, of course, they were left fixed to the cars when the cars were past their prime. Forts and tractor design experiments went on for 10 years and well over 100 prototypes were built. This first model driven here by Henry Ford was made in 1907 and used a lot of Model T parts, including the engine. Some had their engines mounted to one side. And it's rather hard to see in which direction others were actually driven. It seems that the world's first tractor cab may also have been designed by Ford's engineers. The now familiar four wheels, engine at the front and seat at the back was eventually favored. And in 1915, the engineers Eugene Farkas and Joseph Gallam, working with Charlie Sorensen, built a prototype which was to become the Model F, then the N, and finally the E27N Major. The story began more than 50 years ago. This was a story that had a dramatic beginning. The time was 1917. Europe was plunged in the conflict that came to be known as World War I. Britain had, over the years, become industrialized. Farming had suffered. Two-thirds of all food supplies for more than 40 million people came from over the water. But in the sea war, Submarines were sinking Allied shipping at the rate of over half a million tons a month. The question was, how long could the strictly rationed food supplies last? The British knew that agricultural production could not be increased with one or two horsepower methods. An entirely new concept was needed. Concepts are created by men, and the man who was to provide the right concept was across the sea in Detroit, Michigan. His name was already known everywhere, Henry Ford. In 1917, the Ford Automotive Plant, the largest in the world, was producing cars at the rate of more than 300,000 a year. Even though Ford's primary interest was in transportation, he had been a farm boy, and he had always dreamed of making farm work easier and more productive with mechanization. For more than 10 years, he had been experimenting with gasoline tractors. Was it possible to design a machine 
that could be manufactured in quantity to sell at a low price, yet provide ruggedly reliable farm service. By 1917, after years of intensive work, a model had been developed that seemed to provide the answer. With his son, Edsel, Ford had incorporated company to build the new machine. The firm was Henry Ford and Son. The tractor was to be known as the Fordson. It started on gasoline, ran on kerosene, and developed 20 horsepower. More than 50 experimental Fordsons were built, and two were tested in Britain. The British saw them as the first simple, reliable, inexpensive tractors, tractors that anyone could operate. Since they planned to put demobilized soldiers and housewives to work in the fields, this was important. Lord Northcliffe, representing the British government, came to Dearborn to discuss the manufacture of the Fordson in England under close Ford supervision. If there were to be enough of these machines to solve Britain's food problem, it would be necessary to produce them in quantity. But the plan was disrupted by a new phase of the war, the battle for the skies. All of Britain's available factory facilities must be turned to the production of aircraft. Without hesitation, Ford switched back to the alternative of building Fordsons in Dearborn. They worked night and day in a new and unexplored field, an operation that was a lot different from the manufacture of cars. But in spite of all problems, on October 8, 1917, the initial units were completed. They were the world's first mass-produced tractors. Production was slower in the beginning, but through the winter, the pace accelerated. The last of an order of 7,000 machines was delivered to beleaguered Britain in April 1918. Later, a British government spokesman stated, without these machines, the food crisis in all probability would not have been surmounted. As the machines continued to roll off the assembly line, Henry Ford knew he had fired the opening gun in a wider war. A war that would go on long after the European conflict had passed into history. This was a war on hunger, a problem of worldwide proportions. This was a war on farm drudgery. Without mechanical power, efficient food production was all but impossible in the world of limited topsoil and ever-increasing populations. Ford called it power farming. He said, power farming is simply taking the burden from flesh and blood and putting it on steel and motors. This was the beginning of a new age. After Britain's tractors were delivered, mass production made the Fordson available at low cost to American farmers. They took to it on sight. Down the years, the manufacture of this revolutionary tool continued in high gear. And by 1925, no less than 500,000 had been built. This is one of the very first F tractors produced by Ford and Sons. And the first thousand weren't even powered by Ford engines. They were powered by a Hercules engine. This is one of them. And uh, they are similar to Ford engines. But there's a completely different concept between these tractors which is the forerunners of all the modern ones and all the others because here the engine, the transmission and the wheels are all bolted together in one single unit. There's no frame, nothing to collect the dirt, the mud or anything else. Well, they run on paraffin or kerosene in a tank up here and they've got a starting device, a small amount of petrol because otherwise you couldn't start it because paraffin has to be vaporized. Now as they work in an industrial environment, they have an air filter. The air filter is in here, and that is the device that sucks the air in, and they have water in it. Now that's a very clever way of getting rid of the dust, but not so funny in the winter. 
Later on, they started oil bath filters. The ignition, well, the ignition is extremely clever and very simple. These coils, this ring of coils, is bolted to the flywheel housing. The flywheel itself has a magnet which passes these coils and by passing them produces electricity, a flywheel generator. You start the vehicle by swinging it and that is not necessarily easy or good fun, but let's try it. It needs a bit of choke here. Set the advance so it doesn't kick you. A bit of throttle. Keep your fingers crossed. And now everything being ready, with a bit of luck. Lovely. Oh yes, that's just coming up. Very simple thing, you've only got three gears, and once you're in gear, like the traction engine, you can't change it. Well, I'm going into second, and off we go. Arthur Battelle used to drive them when they were first imported. Yes, I used to drive a Model F Fordson. Great tractor, quite modern in its day. Henry Ford's, uh, if you like, answer to the drudgery of the farm. Relatively trouble-free, but uh, it still did give the farmer some problems, but it was because the farmer was not used to servicing it, and uh, it had to have this servicing done quite regularly. One day we wanted to borrow some uh, disc arrows, and we went from here over the fields. Beyond that is the farm on the other side. We went to borrow these disc arrows, and that man over there had a Model F. His method of starting the Model F was to hope it would start, spin violently, and if it started, great. If it didn't, it'd go away and leave it a bit and come, you know, it was choked, obviously. Come back and have another go. And uh, this had happened several times, and he'd get fed up with that. So he'd take all the plugs out, because it was, by this time, got too much petrol in. And take the plugs out, and uh, he would then apply a match to the plug hole. You see, a box of matches and strike it, and stick a match in the plug hole, there would be a fiendish explosion, of, or otherwise, or otherwise, whoo, like a blow lamp, you see, and it do this on all the cylinders, and meanwhile, set the plugs on fire with some petrol to warm them up in a tin lid or something, and uh, it, it would eventually start. And one day, he was doing this procedure with his match, and he filled the tractor up. Now, it never had a filler cap, as I know. It only had a rag bunged in the top of the tank, and... Uh, he put his match in the plug hole one day and it set the dirt on fire around, around the fuel tank. And uh, this took some flame, he said. It was really going well. And he said, I was trying to beat it out with a sack and I accidentally knocked the rag out of the fuel tank, which immediately, <laughs> immediately went up like a firework and fell on the floor. The straw started to burn on <laughs> the track. Anyway, it was coated in oil and dirt, and that caught fire on the side of the engine, and he said, I thought, you know, I'd better get out, because the fuel tank was beginning to, to simmer, and there was flames coming out of the fuel tank, blobbing out of it, he said. And I could see that was going to blow up, so he says, I gave up, he said, I walked away and watched it. <laughs> and he said, eventually, the straw burned out, and the, burn, the, the dirt burned off the outside of it, and the, that fire went out. But the fuel tank got more and more fierce, you see, and it said it was going beautiful, like a blow lamp coming out. <laughs> and it said all at once there was a woof. And he said it blew itself out, the fire did. Because he said it hadn't burnt out, because the fuel tank was still nearly full of fuel. And there the poor decrepit thing that stood all smouldering kind of thing, but the fire had gone out. I said, when I got to it, he said, I was amazed, because he said the fuel tank is, is held on with big u bolts So it was oval at each end, but it was square in the middle. Is it never leaked? He had it a couple of years after that with this square section, mid section fuel tank. You know, these things are quite adventurous to drive. Sadly, have any no brakes at all. They've got only 
Well, here you stay in, they've got no governor control, and if you plough a furrow, you've got to watch where you're going, they can't even look at you, but if you plough a furrow, you've got to actually control your throttle, uh, and disengage the plough, lift it up, and then throttle, shut your throttle again and swing your helm hard over and go back again to where you came. It's not as easy as it sounds, but uh, it's quite an incredible machine. And what's more, they weren't quite as easy to start as this one. This one's been very well maintained. Fordson was producing over 100,000 of these tractors a year in the early 1920s. And well over half of all tractors being sold were Model Fs. When Model F sales started falling in early 1928, Ford decided to stop production. The Dearborn factory was also running out of room for making the F tractor. It was concentrating on the new Model A car, which had just replaced the Model T. But to Henry Ford's surprise, there was still a demand for new tractors, as well as for spares for the three quarters of a million Fs around the world. There was no room to restart production at Dearborn, so the whole of the production line was packed up and shipped to Ford's car factory in Cork in Ireland. Production started there in 1929, by which time there was a huge backlog of orders to work through. These cork tractors were slightly modified and renamed the Model N. The long rear mud guards, which were fitted to some of the Fs, became standard. A toolbox was fitted into the end of each mud guard. These tractors were known as the long wing N. The front wheels were also cast rather than riveted and a cylinder bore was increased to boost power from 20 to 24 horsepower. Forward planning must have been difficult in those days, and even the Fordson management team got it hopelessly wrong. There was a demand for the Model F when the production at Dearborn stopped, but within two years of the cork factory making tractors, demand had all but dried up. Another move seemed to be the answer. So, once again, the production line was boxed up and moved on this time to Dagenham in Essex, where Henry Ford had recently opened another car factory. A few more changes were made to the tractor before production restarted six months later in February 1933. So, when they started production again, the engineers went in for a design change. They changed the colour from grey to blue. And they made a short wing and a long wing. But then they went in for another change. This one. They changed the colour from blue to orange. Well, but to be more serious, they also changed the air filter from the water filter to a much more practical oil bar filter. And this was the sort of tractor that was used by most farmers in this country for ploughing. And I'm going to try it and see what it's like. And the blue one's going to follow me. There's only one way to get a, a, a Fordson in gear if the clutch is bad, and they invariably were. And that is, let the engine warm up stand on the clutch pedal till it's at the bottom, shut the engine down till you've got a, what you think is about the right tick over, then you're standing up, you see, and then get hold of the gear lever and give an immense heave, bang, you know, and it's in. Well, this is the first time I've ever done any power play. OK, well, three or four notches, first gear, and there we go. Follow the line that's been cut before. It's beautiful. The fantastic sensation of driving this old machine and trying to make it as straight a line as I can. And there we are, watching the tree, the sunshine, and the furrow behind. Beautiful. It's a fantastic sensation. So I'm keeping it as nice and steady as I can. Check behind me. And there's the old 
old machine for forming a smooth of silk, cutting the good earth up. It's a lovely sensation. And once I cut the edge, I've got to trip the plow, but not until the last moment, and then swing the wheel hard over. So, the important thing is, don't waste too much fuel. There we go. That's it. Not too bad. More power was needed from the ends, and about the only thing which hadn't been done by now was to increase the compression. So this was done for these orange Dagnum short wings. As fears of a war grew stronger in 1939, Fortson and the British government struck a deal whereby 3,000 tractors would be sold to the Ministry of Agriculture at discount prices and held at Fortson dealerships around the country. If war was declared, they would be waiting to be put into immediate use. But if there was no war, Fortson would buy back the tractors. Some people, particularly other tractor manufacturers, saw this as a huge marketing exercise designed to squeeze them out of the market, rather than as a way Henry Ford could help to feed Britain during a war. There was some talk of a new tractor around this time, but uh, it never appeared in Britain and production on the 3,000 ends was started. Over in America, Harry Ferguson, the Irish engineer, had arrived in Dearborn to see Henry Ford. He brought with him a tractor he had designed with a revolutionary hydraulic control system for the rear lift arms. The tractor was being made at the David Brown factory in Yorkshire. Like Henry Ford, Harry Ferguson was also a farmer's son who had quit the country for city life. When ploughing, Ferguson's tractor could easily outperform the end. His hydraulic system was in fact adopted by most tractor manufacturers. An immediate deal was struck between the two men with nothing more to cement it than a simple handshake. Ferguson was to distribute Ford tractors in America and the grey Ford 9N with the Ferguson hydraulic system went into production in America in 1939. Both Ford and Ferguson badges were carried on the front. A battery with electric start could also be fitted. Some were imported to Britain, but they were never made at Dagenham. Back in Europe, war had broken out and the 3,000 stockpiled ends were distributed. This was the last guys in which the old end was ever seen. Green. Because they painted them green, a better colour for wartime than orange, which could be seen easily from the air. The armed forces also made use of the ends. Many, for example, were used by the Royal Air Force for towing planes around grass airfields. These were often fitted with tracks by roadless and an extension at the front which could carry either a weight or a winch. Some tractors were fitted with other equipment, such as the McConnell hedge cutter, powered by a small stationary engine. A huge advance over cutting by hand. The three-wheeled all-round was made for the American market, although a few were used in the fens in Britain. Rods and levers joined the front wheels to the rear brakes. When the tractor turns, the brakes on the inside wheels come on automatically. It's an early form of power steering. The ends stayed green until the next development in 1945, when the first of the E27N majors appeared. But as the old green end went out, it was replaced by this, the bright blue Major. 
very different form of machinery, much bigger, much heavier, and doing the job remarkably well. By now, tractors had come into the late part of the 20th century. Now, this is a very different way of plowing. It's no longer you sitting comfortably close to the soil. It is the machine doing the job. It's not you anymore. At last, the Trafalts and tractors have come into the 20th century, the latter part. And in a funny way, a lot of that charm is gone. This bright blue tractor was bigger and far more impressive than the N, but was still a direct descendant of the very first Model F from 1917. The N's petrol paraffin engine was used, but a Perkins diesel version was soon available. And for the first time on a Fordson, a battery, electric start and lights were offered. The Ford Ferguson deal fell apart in 1947 when Henry Ford died, because no one was quite sure what the two men had agreed to. Ford in the States replaced the 9N with the 8N, still using the draft control system, but without Ferguson's approval. The company also set up its own marketing operation, making the Ferguson network redundant. Not surprisingly, Ferguson was unhappy with the deal, and lawyers were called in. Eventually, he was awarded nine and a quarter million dollars, rather than the 340 million dollars he had been claiming. Throughout the legal battles, Ford in the United Kingdom continued with the E-27N, and it wasn't until 1951, when the new Fordson Major was announced, that a break was made from the 1915 Farkas design. But even with this new Major, the gearbox was retained. More gears were offered simply by adding a high-low range transfer box. A few Perkins diesel-powered E-27N Majors had been sold, but the new Major was powered by an all-new Ford engine with petrol, petrol paraffin and diesel versions. The diesel version became the most popular because it proved itself to be the first tractor diesel engine to be easy to start, long-lasting and reliable. These Majors were used as a base for many conversions, including the county four-wheel drive tractor with four equal-sized wheels. During the 1950s, as the new Major was selling well as a big tractor, Fordson launched the smaller Dexter, which was later operated into the Super Dexter. They were small enough to be useful around the farmyard. These were the first Fordson tractors to be fitted with a Ferguson draft control hydraulic system and were used a lot for ploughing. The Power Major followed the new Major. And apart from a boost in power from 48 to 52 horsepower, it was very little different. By now, Fordson had realized that draft control hydraulics should be fitted to the majors, and the super major was launched in 1961. Once again, there was an increase in power from 52 to 55 horsepower. And there were also new hydraulics, explained by this launch film. Major in the super class. For real economy, reliability, for power and versatility. And I mean versatility. Don't take a chance, sir. Fortson's your answer. The new super major is here for real economy, reliability, for power and versatility. And I mean versatility. Don't take a chance, sir. Fortson's your answer. The new New hydraulics? Yes, new hydraulics, and plenty of other things besides, because this is an entirely new class of tractor. Fordson have created the Super Class. The Super Major has both position control and quality roll, already tested and proved on the Fordson Dexter. Whichever you want to use is selected simply by raising or lowering this lever. Up for quality roll, down for position control. 
Now, another unique feature of the Super Major's hydraulic system is this flow control valve. In fact, you won't find it on any other tractor. It controls the rate of oil flow to the hydraulics, giving a variable speed of draft response to suit different soil conditions. <laughs> Well, it's marvellous to see all the Ford family here, you know, from the old F through the ends, the long wings, the short wings, the grey ones, and finally to the majors. Mind you, you see a family resemblance right from the very first one to the last. You see them coming out of the same stable, very different concept from the John Deere's and all the others which were really developments from the traction engine. Single cylinders, twin cylinders, driving big gearboxes. This is a completely different idea, a tractor which is brilliant. Mind you, I was going to say, you know, when you drive the old F, that's a hairy old machine. It doesn't half shake you to pieces. The seat's comfortable, but boy, oh boy, those wheels. And then, of course, through the old ends, and they were marvellous. They were like the army bees as you set in them, comfortably, deeply riding, really comfortably. I loved the feel of it. To the major, which is a different feel altogether. It was really, you were remote from life, remote from the fields. You were sitting there, right up there, and all it really needed is the cab round you and the air conditioning. And hey, presto, you were in the remote mechanical farming of the late 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> 